دكتور عماد فين؟ I also thank all my beloved uh, fathers of Sydney and fathers of St. Mary Church. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, until they fix some of uh, the lectures here. Um, I had a question yesterday I want to, to, to answer it for you. Simply somebody came asking me, what exactly should I do to catch kingdom of heaven? It's kind of like the same question given to the Lord. What should I do to reach my eternal life? I remember St. Peter focused on two main points. He said that focus on prayer and focus on love. I think the two major lines to reach kingdom of heaven is to pray without seeding. Pray from your heart, pray the Psalms, pray the liturgy, pray Jesus' prayer, pray whatever, but just try to spend most of your day praying. And praying is the main expression of love. And you want the copy? Yeah, please. Sorry. Okay, come and take it. Yeah. This one, how do you? The first one. Okay. Yeah. The seven C's. You can see it. Um, we were talking about prayer. Praying, the main expression of loving God. You all know that the first commandment given in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that love God from all your heart, all your mind, all your power. So loving God simply expressed in prayer. If you love God, you will chat with God, you will call him, you will listen to him, you will spend time with him. So prayer is the key word of our spiritual life and our eternal life. Because in our eternity, we will always stay in a prayer status. We will all enjoy praising God all the time. The second major point is to love people. I know all of you love others, but you know, the level of love needed is usually much higher than we do. Love is not simply to just feel some emotions towards somebody. No love, as mentioned in the Bible, it's always related to some action. You take action. When you love people, you endure them. You suffer with them. You care for them. You smile at them. You think of them. You help them. So love is always related to what you do, not what you feel. Most of the people think that love is kind of feeling, but this is not Christian love. Christian love is always about what do you do for these people you love. And again, we should love everyone. So we can love those who love us with respect, with sharing, with, but for those who we do not have any kind of relationship, again, we need to love them, to think of them, how to um, approach them in love, how to help them anyway. And when you love people more and more, you will see the truth that you should think of how to give them the most precious thing you have, which is your faith, the truth. You can give them money, you can give them time, you can give them effort, thank you. But you know most of all, you need to give them Jesus Christ, because if you, you give them anything, but you fail to give them the truth, the precious uh, gift in your life, they will end up in hell. So when you love people, you will think in a, in a missionary way, that you, you love to give people uh, your faith. So again, that's a common question. I 
like to start with, we need all to focus on prayer and on love. And the good Christian spend the whole day either praying or loving people. He, he do whatever, but you know, he is always focusing on this too. He spend the day praying and he spend the day loving others. Okay, tonight I would love to tell you what we called it seven C's. It's kind of um, some few words about leadership and about success. The seven C's, C, letter C, of success. I'll give you a few minutes on each of these C's. The first one is charisma. The second, courage. The third, communication. The fourth, commitment. The fifth, consistency. The sixth, competence. And the seventh, confidence. I believe in these seven C's. If you have these seven, you will end up with the eight. The eight is being Christ-like. You will be like Christ. Because our Lord Christ is the source of charisma, he was always courageous, he had the best communication ever, he always committed to his goal, to his mission, he was consistent to save everyone, he was definitely competent, and he is the source of confidence because he is God. So if you get this seven, you will be the best leader, the most successful man on earth. Again, you all need to be leaders because as Christians, people should follow us, not us follow them. Because you know, you are the altar of the spirit. You are the man of God. You are the one who knows the truth. So people suppose they should follow you. But most of the Christians actually follow people. They do not trust themselves enough. They look down to themselves. They don't have enough confidence. They feel low self-esteem. They feel much behind many of, of these civilized people. But being a good Christian, people should look up to you and should follow you. So. If you have these seven, you will be a very good Christian leader. Let's discuss one by one. The word charisma, actually I think this word is mostly um, Greek in origin and it, they took it in Latin, but charisma, we, we use the word in the liturgy. Remember when the priest saying, if charisti so men to you, let us thank God or let us praise God. It's originally let us pray the grace of God. So charis, charis, originally means grace, grace of God. So the charisma originally means that you have some kind of of talent of grace. People look up to you. People are attracted to you. You are special. You are different. And this is the first key of successful people. Charisma in the world usually related to the, to the actors, to the famous people, to those who are very much talented. But in spiritual um, charisma, it's mostly related to the level of humility. Because, you know, it was said, he gives more grace, more grace related to the spirituality. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. So the proud people have little charisma, but gives grace to the humble. The humble people are those who are very much charismatic. When I went, to China and Ethiopia, I noticed that St. Mary, although she never traveled to China or Ethiopia, in both countries they call her mother of China and mother of Ethiopia. In China they draw her with the
eyes, you know, as exactly at their faces. And in Ethiopia, they just uh, draw her like their faces because they feel that she is ours, she is theirs. She relates to them. How could you, Sam, Mary, attract all these people after 2,000 years? How? You never spoke, you never preached, you never even travel in anywhere but Egypt. Um, but she is very much charismatic because she was very, very much humble. Humility is the key of charismatic. If you like to have this charisma of God himself, the charis, the grace of God, you have to be humble. People love the humble people. And all people stay away from the proud people. You can never deal with the proud guys easily. But when you deal with any humble one, you feel like relaxed. You feel like happy. So that's the first one. When we say that one C of success is to have charisma, simply we say you have to be humble like Christ. And remember that Christ made it clear that you should learn from me this. He said it. And also in St. Peter it was written, you younger people submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Look to this, be clothed with humility. So also how to be humble is simply to obey, to obey God, to obey the church, to obey the elders and to obey every, anyone. You are ready to submit yourself. You don't want to follow your mind always. You don't want to stick to your opinion. You can easily um, uh, follow others or submit yourself. And that's the way to be humble. Again, you know, the grace we mean, it's always related to Christ himself. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we need this grace of Jesus himself, the grace of Christ, and we cannot reach, catch this grace of Christ without being humble. So this is the first C. The second C simply is courage. Success sometimes needs a jump in the air. Success needs to have unusual step. Those who stick to the usual steps, the usual pattern of things, they cannot achieve much. St. Paul was very much different. He proved to be one of the very big leaders in Christianity, simply because he was courageous. He took step forward to preach the Jews, then the Asian people, then the Greek people, and he was following the, the Holy Spirit, but because he was very courageous, he could change part of the world. St. Mark one day was kind of a crowd. He wasn't that courageous. He feared um, the Jews at time. But you know, when St. Mark came to our land, he was very strong and he could change the mind of Egyptian. At that time, the pharaohs were strong in mind and they had their civilization. But this man, this young man, could change the mind of Egypt. And we all born Christians because of this man, because he was such a courageous man. So always remind yourself, you need to resist your fear. If you like to achieve much in your life, just resist fear. Stick to God, pray good, and then go forward. Take the step and be strong, don't, be, don't worry. This is a different sermon, actually, <laughs> no problem. Um, being, having courage is always related also to hope. When you hope in God, you believe that God will help you, God will stay with you. God will make it um, fulfilled. 
So you take the step strongly because you are not alone. The third point, I want to finish very quickly so there will be some time for question and answer if you like. The third key word, to have a good Christian leadership and successful servant, service anywhere is communication. You know nowadays communication is a very common word used by all sciences uh, because they found out that the communication is the science of life. And also we consider in our spiritual life that communication is a very important word in our relationship to God. While praying, we communicate with God. While reading the Bible, we listen to him. While serving the people, actually depends on the level of communication. I think all of you know that communication is not related only to what do you say, but it's related also how do you say it? How do you express things? What they call non-verbal communication. How do you look at people in their eyes? How do you smile at them? How do you touch them? These all are part of the, the successful communication. In order to change people, in order to help people to live better, in order to affect their life, in order to uh, live life of mission and have goal in life, you have to have this uh, level of communication. So listening is part of the communication. Our, our Lord Jesus Christ was very much successful even with the very hard cases like the Samaritan woman because he could listen carefully. He did not only preach the word, his word, but he was such a good active listener. And by listening to her, she could love him. She felt better because she could explain what's behind her problems. And you know, um, our Lord Christ had a dialogue with the blind man, the born blind, with the crippled man. So he, he was always in a dialogue with the disciples, with the Jews, with the um, sick people. So he lived such a life. And because of this communication, we could see how much successful he was. And he made it a role model for us. So let's revise the first one, charisma. And you know, it's always related to what? To humility, OK? The second point is, you sleepy, huh? <laughs> charisma and courage, and the third, communication. The fourth word is commitment. You cannot achieve much in your life, in any, any way in your life, spiritual, career-wise, study-wise, relationships. You cannot achieve much if you are not committed. People like the commitment, the faithfulness, being honest in whatever you do, whatever you say, will let everyone respect you. And they will look up to you. They can follow you. Look to this verse given in the book of Proverbs. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Faithfulness, part of it is being committed. Commitment is very much related to being honest and faithful. Again, the Lord himself said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Actually, even on earth, while living in this life, people usually consider whoever is faithful in a career, they will put, push him up. He will take a better place in his career. But if you are not very honest, you are not faithful, you will not grow up in your career. So it's the same in spiritual life. 
It's the same in service. When you are very faithful in your, whatever you do in service, God will open many other doors in service and you will be much better and achieve much. Again, please, while listening to me, just evaluate yourself. How much humility or charisma you have? How much courage you have? Are you really in a good communication with others? Do you have such commitment in your life? Um, again, concerning commitment, my eyes, God say, shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. So this kind of perfectionism, we all commanded to be perfect like God. And God is perfect. God is always committed to whatever he says. The fifth point is consistency. Consistency is always related to continu continuation. Just continue what you started with the same frequency, with the same passion, with the same um, interest, with the same vision. So many people nowadays start whatever, start in a passionate way, start in a good way. But after some time, they lose interest. They are not as much as they started. So look to this. Anyone who was successful in his life, he was consistent. He fought for his success. He continued what, what he started. Again, let's put it this way. You cannot continue in such a, a strong way if you do not have a clear vision, a clear target to fight for. But we Christians have very clear vision that we all want to catch kingdom of heaven. We all need to go to heaven. That's the clear vision we have. That's the, the target we have. And while going to heaven, we need everyone to come with us. So we are always busy loving people and telling them, come with us. Just follow us, because we are not living for this life. We are aiming at the next life. If you are focusing, if you have such a target, you will continue. Even in times of uh, hardships, even in times of, of uh, frustrations, you will continue, because you have such a clear goal. Again, you have to set your priorities. I could see that many of you young people, that they do not know how to set their priorities. They are just busy. But when you look at this business, actually you can see that they are wasting most of their life. They are busy doing nothing or doing trivial things. But we should be busy with the most important points before the important points. And we do not have any time for non-important points. So setting the priority will make you a successful person, a good Christian leader. Again, you have to plan for your day, plan for your week, plan for your year, plan for your life. Don't let it go that way. When you plan for it, actually, you will succeed to achieve much. Look to St. Paul when he summarized his whole life in, with the end of his day. That's the last chapter written by St. Paul. That's his last chapter, not only the last letter. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is led up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So that man was consistent. He fought the fight. He fought the good fight. And he finished the race. He spent whole life as running 
because he was serious. That's why he achieved much. The sixth point is the competence. Competence means that you are always aiming at excellence. You are not just one to do things, but you want to do whatever you do in a perfect way, in the best way. You don't accept things like just this way. No, you want everything as perfect as we can. In your life, in your relations, in your career, in your reading, in your time, um, whatever you do. So this way will help you to live a much better life. People accept many things which are much less than you know average. Um, when you think of competence, you need to study more. Whatever you do, you need to study. Let me tell you, most of the Christian did not study the Bible. Why you study many things in the university and because of your career, you spend many, many hours. Why you, do, you did not spend these hours in the Bible? Because you never thought of being perfect in God and good in your relationship with God. So competence means that you are achieving things in its best way. Um, also to be competent, you have to cover whatever you study or whatever you do in all the sides, in all channels. Because when you look to something from one side, you are not very competent. You have to be careful and see things from all sides. In management, you have to put the right person in the right time, in the right place, with the right method. So you choose all with the right thing to do and the right man to help or to share. The last point is confidence. You can never be a good Christian leader without self-confidence. And when we speak about self-confidence, we never mean being proud of yourself. No, it's far different than the pride. The pride is related to how I see myself just myself. But the self-confidence in the Christian view, it's simply, I can see how God looks at me. I'm weak, I'm little, but God loves me. God gives me his Holy Spirit. I'm sharing God, his kingdom. So I can be confident. I trust in myself because God trusted me. God gave me his, his spirit. So if I have that good faith, I will have the self-confidence. All Christians should be confident. Not because they are strong, not because they are rich, not because they know everything, but simply because they know that they, they are the sons of God. So with faith, you will have this confidence. Simply confidence is much, very much related to your confidence in God. Any child who believes in his father as powerful father, he feels confident. But we do not feel as confident because we do not trust our father enough. So in order to achieve it, you're along with this self-confidence related to, to trust, to spiritual faith. Again, do not think of yourself more highly than what you ought to think. When we say you have to be confident, we are not saying that you do just things you can never do. No. You can know exactly what you can and what you cannot. And you are you're accepting yourself this way. You are confident that you something you cannot do and you can say, so, sorry, this is not mine. This thing I cannot do. And those who trust in themselves, they never promise things they cannot do. But some people may promise things they cannot do just because they feel embarrassed or they wish to do things. But if you have this self-confidence, you will be very straight. This I can do, this I cannot. And still you are happy. 
And good people are always like that. They never promise higher than they ought to think. Again, for the confidence, we should mention that failures in our life is part of our success. Failures in our life is the commencement of a greater success. So don't avoid failure. You have to fail for some time, even in a spiritual life. We all promise God to be good, but we could not. But again, we try, we struggle, and God is happy with struggling. And whatever failures you passed by, actually it's part of your um, maturity. Remember St. Peter, he was never, never as strong St. Peter, except after his denial, he, he fell down. He had a big failure. St. Paul had a big failure. Joseph in the Old Testament had a big failure at a time. Moses actually had a big failure. So they experienced failure, frustration, depression, loneliness, hardships. They experienced these hard things. But because of this, they were strong. They overcame it. They could make many good things. So don't think that the successful people are never failures. No. Actually, they should, they would have passed many negative experiences. Again, let's put it again in order to revise everything. Uh, charisma and courage, communication, commitment, consistency, competence, and confidence. Again, if you have this seven C, you will be Christ-like as a leader. You will be successful as a good Christian. You will live a better life, and also you will give some better life for others and follow the steps of our Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have questions, okay. questions. Is it permissible for a Christian to have tattoos of Christ, the saints, and Bible verses on the arms, shoulders, or chest? to live a um, purified life, that's much more important than just having tattoos. But it's all up to you. How can I pray? <coughs> Simply, you pray when you speak to God. Whatever you say to God is prayer. And you know, God listens carefully to whatever you say. And just express what you feel when you are down, when you are happy, when you need something, express yourself the way you like. One of the saints said that the simple words of a child accepted in the ease of God in a much 
um, happier way than the big words of wise people. So just express your needs, whatever you like, speak to God. But again, the church gave us some good, strong prayers, like the prayer, the Psalms, like the liturgies, the masses, like Jesus' prayer. So enjoy all these kinds of prayer. I think you all have fathers of confession. It's better to have a program for prayer. Qanun ruh. Because you know, when you pray, um, Baker, the morning prayer, and you pray the afternoon prayer, and all the day you speak to Christ and you keep saying the name of the Lord, my Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, I'm the sinner. And you know, when you enjoy the hymns of the church, so you can cover the whole day with prayer. Because this is the advice given by the Lord himself, Try to pray without ceasing. So we need to struggle for this. It's not easy to, to, rec to call God all the time, but you can just exercise it while driving, while walking, while working, anywhere, anytime, you can just pray. Wouldn't an innocent man guilty man? Yeah, I think. Yes. Add to the guilty of the guilt of the guilty man. Yes. you from this thing and repentance can reveal can you know all the sins whatever you have done intentionally or unintentionally you know because you pray God you ask for his forgiveness you will be forgiven for everything um, as did Christ rose from the dead what price did he pay for our salvation his suffering yes Christ paid his blood for our salvation and his suffering part of this you know he came to die for everyone because he is not only a man but he is God so he can redeem all people his blood can cover all sins because it's he is not just a man just a simple human being a limited one but he is God incarnated. So his blood can do everything, can cover all sin. Then Christ died once and for all, then why do we repeat this sacrifice? We do not repeat the sacrifice. We celebrate the same sacrifice. It's not kind of repetition. When we pray the liturgy, it's the same body of Christ who were on the cross. It's the same body of Christ who was in the tomb. It's the same body of Christ who raised out of death. So it's one Christ. And our Lord Christ is not of the past. He is the past, the present, and the future. Again, he is not just a man limited by time. That's why we are celebrating his sacrifice not repeating what he had done would it be more of a remembrance yes it has some element of remember but let me tell you one thing i used to be um, a disciple of abu nabshoi one day like 45 years ago in egypt but i can remember him 
in my mind when I uh, in Egypt. But when I come and see him and he hugged me, you know, it's different. I remember him now on a, on a life level. That's the sacrament of, of uh, Eucharist. That we enjoy the same Christ. We, we eat him exactly as the disciples ate him. So remembrance has many levels. Some level we just remember in mind. But when you see your friend after many years, you, you know, uh, recall again the whole event. Make it life again. That's exactly what meant because it, the word remembrance is very weak translation in the Greek, the Greek language. It's much more than just remembering. When you go back to the, to the exact words given by the Lord, it's not kind of uh, remembrance by mind. It's much more than this. Um, every priest stand ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrament, which can never take away sin. Actually, this is Hebrews, and he was speaking about the old priesthood, the priests of the Old Testament. That's why he said they can never take away sin. When you go back to this chapter, Hebrews 10, St. Paul was, you know, putting the priesthood of the Old Testament in comparison with the priesthood of the New Testament. And he was proving that the Old Testament, the sacrifices could never cover, the sin could never solve this, the problem. But nowadays, following the, our um, great This kind of real friendship um, will it stay will it stay like online only <laughs> or you will meet together so uh, I'm not sure of what exactly the details of this but you know in my little experience I could see that the online dating are not very much successful those who just knew each other on the Facebook uh, or whatever, they couldn't understand each other perfectly. Because some people from Egypt, you know, um, they chat with somebody like you in Australia, and after one or two months, they plan to marry each other. But I don't think this is enough for understanding each other. So better face to face, and better, um, I don't believe much in the IT marriage or <laughs> whatever technology matter. How do we know if someone is your soulmate? Again, I don't know what you mean by soulmate. <laughs> Intimate friend or your future husband? Or... Let me answer my way. Uh, if you think of marrying anyone, please put the spiritual relationship as a first priority. See your partner in the future, whether he loves God. Imagine your life with him. Will you go to the church regularly? Will you care to bring your children to the church? Will you live together as Christian family? Does this man think of these things or he, he is not busy with these things? I think that's a major point. Before you look to him as successful man or girl, before you evaluate the money issues or the family issues or the Egyptian background, please consider the spiritual level. Because 
I could see that the main problem after marriage is the spirituality. If both of them are people of God, they can overcome any problem in their life. If God is not there, any little problem can destroy their relationship. Um, what is the biggest, biggest issue in mission service you face in countries where there is no Christianity or no Orthodox? There are many issues and they are not the same. While serving in Africa, we faced the problem of insects, the problem of darkness, the, prob the problem of, you know, ignorance and sicknesses. And we suffered from many things but in Asian countries are different. We may have some problems with the government of the country that they do not allow any kind of preaching. In some countries, you know, the language is the real barrier. They do not speak any English. So it's not the same everywhere. But you know, the, the man who have a missionary heart or people of God who just live their life to preach the word of God, they actually never, um, never stop their mission. They fight to give them, to deliver the message. And I, had, I have many, many good stories for people like you, young men and women who gave their life to missionary services and they are enjoying their life and they are delivering the message successfully and we could see many baptized people because of their um, um, labor. How long would you suggest the courtship period is before engagement? Um, I prefer like three months to maximum six months because you know uh, after six months, you know, the old people like us, the parents, feel anxious because it's not very safe. Just you live a love story with no ending, with no, um, you know, we cannot see what's will, what will happen. And in our Egyptian culture, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Egy Egyptian, so, um, some of the men, you know, enjoy the time of whatever be before engagement. And when it comes to giving a word and proposing, they just say, I'm not very much convinced. I don't feel very much happy. Sorry, I cannot continue. And the girl actually got attached and she waited for long, long periods. So, she feels like hurt. So I'm not happy with the long periods before engagement. I see usually many problems because of this. So from three to six months, I think it's fine. And with, you know, it has to be transparent. We have to, uh, to tell each other everything except sins, but you have to be like, um, uh, I mean transparency. Tell them the, the future plans, tell, tell the partner what you like, what you not, do not like, uh, some family background, some childhood background. So while chatting this way, you can understand the guy. As did Christ rose from the dead, what price did he pay? I think it's the same question. How to attain the godly wisdom? And knowing God is happy with my acts. That's like two questions. Godly wisdom, simply you just ask for this. Pray asking God for his wisdom. It was written in the book of James in this first chapter. Man to always who hikmah falyatlu min Allah. Whoever needs wisdom, just pray asking God for his wisdom. And he will be given. You know, this prayer is always accepted by God. 
because, because God loves to give his wisdom to his people. He loves to give it. So it's easy, as easy as God gives me wisdom in whatever occasions, in whatever um, problem. Again, when you study the word of God, you get his wisdom. The word of God starting from the gospel, the Psalms, the Proverbs, the epistles of St. Paul, the book of Moses, all books of the, of the Bible actually will give you more and more wisdom. The third point is to live the life of discipleship. We Orthodox people believe so much in discipleship that you have to look to the saints, to your fathers, to the good people living around, to the good models. So when you look up to these people, you will have more wisdom. But when you focus on yourself, you will believe as if you do not need any more wisdom. And there is also another verse saying, uh, whoever believes in himself as wise, he should believe that he is very unwise to be wise. So think this way, I'm not wise enough, I need more and more wisdom. Um, someone like Emperor Constantine, who killed many even after he became Christian, caused a lot of damage to the Christian faith by political decisions. So why is he regarded as a saint in our church? First of all, I want to tell you one important point nowadays. Please read the history from, uh, of very good um, books, and not all books of history are honest. Many people, wrote the history in their way to show as Copts were never good and our church were always deviated. So when you read the history, please try to read the original books and to be fair. Because many people may say that they are historians, but they are not, they are not honest. They put their, you know, view while writing things. So many people said that Constantine was not good. Actually, he was not, you know, the perfect guy because he was a king. But actually, you know, when you study his life, he was one of the very good Christian king in history. But he, it does not mean that he never sinned. But you know, we had in the tradition, the Coptic tradition, one um, story that Constantine uh, appeared to Saint Anthony after he went to heaven and he was crying saying I wish to be like one of your disciples I wish to be a monk because I knew what kind of glory waiting for your style of life so that's one of the traditions so we believe that this man was good but he was not perfect again i'm saying please i wish all of you study history because nowadays people are trying to distort history like in our land you know they tend to say that christianity in egypt accepted in the sixth and seventh century the those who came to our land egypt happily and they enjoyed 500 years or 1400 years now uh, accepting their faith, which is not true. The history never said so. We suffered a lot. We suffered so much. Many, many of our grandfathers were killed. But the history can say different things. So please go and study. Um, Tell us about the mission you do in China, other Asian countries, how can we get involved? Actually, we have a program for evangelism. You can um, study online because we, we do not allow for anyone to go for evangelism just being Christian. 
he have to study at least six months to study the Bible and to know how to approach people and to research the country he is going to go and join a team and within the team they can plan for the mission coming. But you know, for doctors, uh, pharmacists, dentists, we allow them because they will just do their career, their tasks, and thank God, nowadays we have like five missions, medical missions per month. So we have more than 60 medical missions per year. Any one of you is related to medical services can give us his contact and we can follow up with him, telling him um, whenever he is uh, ready to go, which country he can go. Um, what it, the Coptic Church stands on Western music? Is it considered sinful? Western music. Actually, Western music is a very wide word because in Western music there are many, many, you know, kinds of music, as far as I know, because I love music. So some of this um, very quiet uh, symphonies or, you know, what you call it, light music, is very much accepted because you can meditate while listening to some quiet music. You can even read the Bible. And you know, actually in our church, we love music. We use music in our liturgies. And we always pray with melodies. We do not pray just words. So we are um, in love with the music. David, one of the prophets, was a musician. And he mentioned many, many two instruments of music in his book of Psalms. So we respect music, but some music, you know, it's kind of a pushing physical uh, excitement, or, you know, it's kind of, um, I cannot express it, you know, aggressive music. In, I cannot pray while listening to this music. I always ask myself, Whatever things happening, can I pray? But if this environment will not allow me to pray, so I'm not happy with this. In any condition, just ask you yourself one question. Can you pray now? If you can, okay, just fine. But I think if you are honest with yourself, in many things you cannot pray. In many places you cannot pray. With some people you cannot pray. Because you are simply doing mistakes, you are not in light. So it's not the time to pray. Uh, so you answered the question, not all Western music are accepted, but it's, you know, personal. It's not always uh, the same for everyone. What is your definition of success? I feel like in this culture we focus too much on worldly success when we should be focusing on spiritual success. But how do we define spiritual success? Okay, spiritual success simply is to live your life for God, is to live according to His will, is to succeed to fulfill His commandments. That's simply spiritual success, is to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit inside your heart. That's the success. Actually, Saint Macarius, the Great, said that the goal for all Christians is to follow, is to be guided by the Holy Spirit. So you pray just to be guided by the Spirit. You read the Bible to be guided by the Spirit. You go for confession to be guided by the Spirit. If you are guided by the Spirit, you are a saint. That's simply the definition of being saint, because simply the Holy Spirit guides you. You will not be like exactly as Athanasius or St. Paul or Amber Abraham or St. Mary. You will be you. You will be different, but you will be a saint, simply because you are just guided by the Spirit. Orthodoxy is under a huge pressure 
and many people are leaving it. How will I know that it's my way to heaven? First of all, you have to understand orthodoxy because, you know, people tend to accuse orthodoxy without understanding even what orthodoxy means. Orthodoxy simply is the apostolic faith. In the life of the church in the early 400 years. That's simply orthodoxy. Orthodoxy was Christianity as well known in the few uh, first few generations. That's orthodoxy, the straight kind of life Christian lived before. So it's not orthodoxy to say this hymn is accepted, this hymn is not accepted. Uh, uh, girls should wear this or not that. Uh, it's not that. Orthodoxy simply is the sane doctrine of the church and also the perfect way to worship God. And orthodoxy nowadays have different tastes according to the church. There is Indian orthodoxy, there is Ethiopian orthodoxy, there is Syrian orthodoxy, there is Russian orthodoxy. But they all, you know, start by being orthodox. Orthodox mean in faith. They are ha having the original, the traditional, the apostolic, the old faith lived by the church in the few hundred years, uh, in the early few hundred years. So that's orthodox. So yes, it's always attacked all through the two thousand years, it's, it was always some, you know, fight against orthodoxy. Because in my belief, it's the right way to live as Christian. And when you study history again, you will understand what was it like and what happened in the fifth century that there was were deviation or, you know, Eastern Church and Western Church. And in the 11th century, from the Western Church, there is, there is Catholic and non-Catholic. And in the 16th century, Protestant came out of Catholic. So when you study the history, you can understand what, why Christians are that way now. But you cannot tell, except if you understand the history. Simply, orthodoxy was Christianity as mentioned in the Bible, lived by the saints, uh, written in the old books of the church. It does not mean that we will not use the old things, the new things like the computer or the mic. No, we will live in our generation, but we will have the same doctrine. We will have the same way of worshiping God. Let me tell you, the only churches in the whole world who celebrate the cross of Christ like more than 20 hours in two days are the Orthodox Church. You know, in, in um, Big Friday, what do you call it here? Good Friday, we spent more than eight hours praying and few hours rest and then we come back for Abu Ghalam Sis and few hours rest and then we come back for Uddas uh, al So, are we mad people? No, we are not crazy. Actually, we love Christ. And act no one is coming, you know, because the church forcing him to come. People are happy coming. So, what do you see? I don't see in any way, in, in anywhere in this world, people love the church as our people. So why you say that orthodoxy is always attacked, it's not up to, this is not orthodox. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we believe that uh, because our church are not very much ordered or organized, this is orthodoxy, no, actually, the, or, the order in the church is very much orthodox. And we should pray in very much quiet environment. That's the teaching of the forefathers. So when you understand what's orthodoxy, I think you will love it. 
Um, regarding Jesus on the cross, wouldn't an innocent man, again, that's the soil. When you can clearly see someone in a higher authority in the church, a senior servant or even a priest doing something wrong, it's often very unaccepted. If a young person point this out to them, even if it's in a very respectful or private way, this makes it harder to look up to them as leader or follow them. I feel that I have Okay, I think I got the question. Okay. I feel they are a hypocrite and they cause me and many others to stumble. What do you advise? Okay, I'm, I can tell you I'm, I'm really sorry for this. You have a point. Because I'm a father in a church, but I would love if anyone is hurt because of my behavior, I would love he comes to me telling me, Abuna, Abuna, I'm not happy because I felt so and so. As a father, I will be happy to say sorry or to tell him what exactly the story because he is my son. But some people, you know, not as you mentioned, are not polite or respectful in their criticism. Many people tend to insult the responsible people. And even without understanding the story or just investigating what exactly happened. So all I wish you to do is just wait and understand things and investigate if you are um, yani, careful of this. But you know, when you go to any man of God, please rem remind yourself, he is still a man. He may make mistakes, but he is trying to please God. So accept him, respect him as a father, and tell him what exactly you feel and I think in this way, you will feel much better. And actually, you will help me to save others who were stumbled, as you say. So if I, I'm not accepting any comments, actually, that's very bad for me. I should accept comments. But again, for you, young people, please keep the respect. I'll remind you of one story given in the Old Testament. Remember Noah? Noah was a great man, a saint. But actually, after the story of the ark and the flood, he made a big sin. He was drunk one day. And two of his sons respected him in his weakness and covered him in his sin. Because they knew that this man is the man of God. And now he is in a minute of weakness. And without this man, we would have been, you know, destructed and died with these people in the flood. While Canaan, the grandson, did not respect his grandfather. And he was accursed because of his disrespect. So although we are not always perfect, Definitely, we are people living on earth, and we never say that priests or bishops are saints. But we are trying to please God and to fulfill the needs of the church. Please help me to do my mission. But you know, don't just judge me. And I'm not supposed to judge you. I'm, I'm supposed to teach you, to love you to care for you. That's my mission. But I'm not here just to, sh to judge you and tell you you are bad. I think you, you feel you are bad yourself, so you don't need me in this. 
I eventually want to meet someone and marry when and I and if God wills will is but at the moment I struggle to find companionship through finding friends aged 28 to 32 from 28 to 32 exactly okay who are single and in the same stage as I am in church even through doing service how can I find like minded Christian friend that I can relate to I don't think I can help you <laughs> Just pray and I think you can see hundreds of good girls and I think good friends and you can see uh, what exactly you need. But you need to pray and you know, some people think I'm very good and I don't think no one deserves me <laughs> or no one up to my... Uh, um, dreams so just be humble show you well in today's society with so many sources of attraction and distraction in the world what is the best tool if there is one which we can use to attract people to christ love people there is no other way to attract people to christ except love them love means respect care help serve um, fight for their needs, listen to them, just love them. When you love people, they will be attracted to you. And loving in, the, in Christ's way is always successful. That's the best and maybe the only way to attract people. Also, you know, nowadays, you young people, you need to study apologetics. You need to know how to reason your faith because people will not take the faith just blindly because you say there is God so there is God no they will always ask you to prove give me proofs that's the way people think nowadays they need to respect their mind to talk logic to speak science so what we need to study in order to be up to their needs. And logic, science are there to prove existence of God and to prove the history of the Bible and to prove that Christ is the Lord and to prove there is another life. Logic and science are with us, not against us. When you study, you will find out that there is no problem with science or logic. The problem is that we are not logic enough in our talks so they will not see us as up to their needs um, what is the tool we can use to enlighten the growing number of atheists in world again to be good christians if we live good christian life many of those who left the church or who left christianity will come back because people are always seeking to see the real good Christian life. We can speak words, we can give lectures, but we need, to, we need to live the life of Christ. I'll tell you one story to end this, if you don't mind. Uh, I was helping, uh, like 30 years ago, in Egypt, Mother Teresa, um, um, projects in Egypt because I was a physician and I tried to help them because they cared for the poor in Egypt in Cairo they have, they have two centers in Cairo and the nuns were mostly Indian and some European and they were all like the nuns following Mother Teresa and one day um, my co-servants asked the mother in charge you do not speak to these people ever about Christ. So the mother in charge said, we never speak, we just love. So one of these servants asked her, but most of them are not Christian. You have a great chance to speak the word of God. Tell them about Christ. She said again, we are not allowed to speak. 
we are allowed only to love. So one of the old men living there, he was Christian, took me aside and tell me, doctor, don't worry. All those who are served in this place, they ask to be baptized before they die, just because of their love. You got the meaning? So all those who were served, they ask to be baptized just because of their love. So sometimes we know how to say words, to speak, but it's much better to know how to love. And love is much, you know, costly. It's not easy. But to speak, it's very easy. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, please pray for me. Glory to God. Amen.